So today, we'll be talking about startup and init, and uh, that will include talking about the boot process. We'll mention the BIOS briefly, talk about the bootloaders, Lilo and Grub, uh, walk down through some of the, the setup and kernel startup steps, and then probably the main and most important part is talking about init and run levels and uh, the RC scripts, the, the run scripts that start up before. So can someone just offer uh, why it's called bootstrapping? Where that term comes from? Does anyone have any idea? I'm sure some of you do. I think it's a Mariner's term. Uh, I don't know that if it is. I've never heard that before. Originally, yeah, I think it's uh, when you, if you uh, fall off the boat, uh, you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, literally. Right. Well, that I. I this out. <laughs> it's like if you fall off the uh, and you, I mean, you're tied under your boot or something. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. I never heard of it attributed to mariners before, but I can certainly see that you have that problem if you fall off of a ship. But it's definitely what you say. It's the idea of trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, which is a, a hard thing to do. So on a on a computer system, you have the same problem. Uh, you have the initial program that you want to run that's probably sitting on some kind of medium. Uh, these days it would probably be a disk and you need to get that program copied into memory. Well to copy it into memory you need to be able to read it off the disk which means you need some kind of driver code that knows how to access the hardware, copy bytes off the hardware into RAM, allocate RAM for it and so forth but that means you need a program that's in memory that's running and so you're back to where you started from and so bootstrapping was the idea of how to get around that, that exact problem. On some old computers, you, they literally had switches on the front, and you could manually bootstrap a computer. There was um, some of the very first microcomputers were like this, and, and in particular, uh, the Altair, I think, had a switch set on it, and there was one called the MSI. And when I was in undergraduate school, uh, my roommate <clears throat> was a, a PhD student, and he had, even though he's an electrical engineering uh, major, he actually had a essentially a physics lab where he was colliding electrons and, and ions or atoms and ionizing them and he had all these 19 inch racks of equipment and one of the things he had in there was an MSI computer and, and it was really cool looking because it had like red switches and blue switches you know those really cool 70s colors so I always thought that was really neat and, and generally you would have a, uh, a set of switches that represented a byte register that would be eight switches to, to set a byte value and then a set of 16 switches to represent an address and, and you would set all the, the bits for the byte that you wanted to load and push a load switch and that would load that byte into that memory address and then the, if you had the auto increment switch switched on it would increment to the next address. You could set the switches for the next byte and load that one. And when you had them all loaded you could hit the run switch and start executing that program and, and then run that and what you might do is load in a program to then read a paper tape drive for example and then you could load your program and then go from there. So that was one way to bootstrap a system these days, the common way to bootstrap a system is with a read-only memory. So fortunately, <coughs> um, we've had for a while uh, memory that, that persists across uh, system power being down. And uh, one, they were ROMs originally, and then you had programmable ROMs. And uh, then, I guess, erasable programmable ROMs, you could, you could program them with uh, enough current, and then you could erase them with UV light, and then we had EE proms that you can erase and change all the time. But generally, you have some memory that's already out there that has your bootstrap code on it, and when the system comes up, it just runs that code. That code has enough information to start reading something from another medium, which then has enough information to read probably another program, which may have enough information to read another program. And over, you know, through all these steps, you eventually get to the point where you've loaded the kernel or whatever it is that you want to run. So I'm going to go through and describe a lot of how this works. This is, I'm certainly not an expert on, on all of the steps here for uh, how x86 hardware works, but these are the basic ideas. And uh, everything we talk about here is going to be x86 specific. So other architectures would have different, but probably similar steps that they go through. A lot of the basic ideas are the same. So there's a reset pin on the processor. And the first thing that happens when you boot a system is that the a, a, a positive, positive logical value, I guess. I don't know. But it, anyway, that pin is triggered. It could be a, a, a high voltage or a low. I'm not sure which. And uh, you reset the processor. This will go through and initialize some registers, and two important registers are the CS register, which I believe has the address of the stack and some other flags and things in there as well, and then the EIP register, which is the instruction pointer, and that says, 
you know, what, what a CPU does is it goes through memory and it loads in data out of the memory and it executes that data as machine instructions. And so that's the first memory address that we're going to start loading memory from, loading instructions from. And it takes uh, code and begins to uh, execute, it, it maps that ROM code into memory and begin to, begins executing it at this particular address. So one of the things I wanted to mention is if you're not familiar with the hex addresses that you see a lot throughout these slides, like the zero in all apps and a zero, if you're not really sure if you sort of know the basics but you're not clear on exactly how that works in the arithmetic, that would be a topic that we can talk about this coming Wednesday at that extra session. So be sure to come to that and ask me if you want uh, more information about that. So the, these days what's in the ROM is the BIOS, which is the basic input-output system, and this has been around from the very early days of DOS. Uh, this is an interrupt-driven process and it basically provides access to the hardware. So it has a lot of handlers for interrupts that are in there. And the BIOS was actually a, a critical part of the DOS operating system. So when DOS would do system calls, it would uh, call particular interrupts and go down and execute code out of the BIOS. But in the case of the Linux world, the, uh, the BIOS is itself not at all a major part of the, the Linux operating system. It uses the BIOS to get the, the bootstrap process and get the, the kernel loaded, and after that the BIOS is, is gone. It's, it's done with it. It doesn't really use it anymore after that. Linux uses all of its own device drivers and interrupt handlers. So um, it's just for the boot process. So the steps that happen out of the BIOS are power on self-test, and we're all pretty familiar with those. Uh, there's a uh, ACPI which uh, basically goes through and sets up power management for devices, and that's something that most computers have these days. The ability for, uh, and in the case of ACPI, there's a kernel interface, so the operating system itself can go in and, and decide when to power something down or set it to a lower power usage level. So there's initialization for that. And then there's hardware initialization, and the very basic idea of devices on a, on a PC type system is there are three ways in general to communicate with them. There's an I.O. port, which is a particular channel, a particular bus from the, the CPU, and the, the CPU can do I.O. to a particular device over a particular, over the, the port one byte at a time, basically, and there are port addresses that it uses to talk to different devices. So there's a port address, there's a uh, actually memory mapping where you take some, some memory that's on the device or something that looks like memory and you map that into the actual address space of the computer and so by reading and writing to those addresses you're actually reading and writing uh, to the device. So that's another important part. And, th and the third way is setting up particular interrupts. So there's a, a fixed set of interrupts on a PC system and when a device is ready to talk to the system it, it raises its particular interrupt and that should cause, in this case the kernel, in the case of Linux, to then run a device driver for that device and then go read data from it or whatever it needs to do to manage that device. And it used to be, if you remember back to the, uh, I guess, ISA days of setting up these systems, the part of the trick of adding devices to a system was picking values for all of these. Usually you can program the device to use a certain interrupt and a certain set of address ranges and you had to pick those so they didn't conflict with each other so that one device wasn't using the same interrupt or an overlapping memory range as another one. PCI helps tremendously with this by automating that process and helping to configure devices so they don't, they don't uh, conflict with each other. So that happens, you get all the interrupts and, and all the mapping of devices into address space and so forth, that's all happened. And uh, then what the BIOS can do, in fact these days a BIOS has a lot of programmable options. And one of the things you can program is what the devices are that you're going to boot from. So uh, usually you, you have a choice of uh, the hard drive or, or one or more hard drives and the CD-ROM and uh, probably a USB device and it used to be floppies but those are pretty much going away so you can pick what you can boot from and the order <coughs> and the BIOS will start looking at these devices and try to find a boot sector that uh, has code that it can load. When it finds a boot sector on the first device that, that has something out there that, that it can load and execute it'll copy that, that one sector, and a, a sector on a disk drive is 512 bytes. So a disk drive is, is organized into these little sectors of, of 512. So it'll copy that one into this particular RAM address, and then it'll jump to that address and start running that code. 
So what that sector is, the first sector of a partition or, or a disk or one of these devices is called the master boot record. And it has the code that we just talked about and it. it also, on a hard drive, will have uh, information about the partition table. And uh, what you need to do is, is put this boot code in that, that location. It's interesting that Linux itself, up through uh, kernel versions 2.4, actually had a bootloader built into the kernel image. So if you just simply copy the kernel onto a disk, like a floppy, that automatically made it bootable because that first 512 bytes was a built-in bootloader and it could boot itself. You didn't have to do anything special. Since 2.4, there's no longer a bootloader that's part of the Linux kernel image, so you always have to have a separate bootloader from the kernel itself that's actually going to handle the booting. So the two bootloaders that are most popular in the Linux world are Lilo, the Linux loader, and another one called Grub, which is part of the GNU project and is called the Grand Unified Bootloader. And uh, Lilo pretty much was popular first, and then Grub has come along later. There are a number of differences between them, but, but some of the most important ones, I think, are uh, Lilo has a way to set up a config file, and the config files for these bootloaders always have something like, uh, we're going to put up a prompt, maybe, and uh, we'll give you so many seconds to, to pick an operating system and then we'll boot to a default one. So you can, you can have it point to different operating system images on different disk partitions and you can put up a menu and let the user pick one of those or you'll boot to a default one and they usually have the actual uh, line, command line that you need to send to the boot process to boot that operating system image. They have a way to boot Linux and Windows and probably other operating systems too. So with Lilo, if you change what that config is, then you have to run a program, which is usually just called Lilo, to take that config file and it builds a new image that goes into the master boot record and, and loads that in there. So if you don't do that, then your changes haven't actually been put into the master boot record and it's all self-contained. In the case of Grub, Grub is a much more general purpose programmer, uh, program that has its own shell and, and uh, it can be used for lots of different things. You can actually run it does is that it actually knows how to read file systems. So Grub can actually go out and look at an ext3 file system, find a file out there, and the typical file that its configuration is in is in uh, slash boot slash grub, and it's called menu.lst by default. Some systems give it a different name. And so with Grub, you can go change that file, and you don't have to load anything into the bootloader. That's, the code is already there. It'll go out and find your changes and implement those directly. And since Grub is, is a general purpose program, you can also just boot into Grub and, and you can bring up the shell and actually boot systems sort of by hand by typing in all the commands. You can do things like password protection and, and other stuff like that too. These days, uh, you, you probably see Grub most of the time. So a lot of times you'll hear this talk about multi-stage bootloaders and the basic idea is this. You can't fit everything you need to do into the 512 byte sector. So you use the first 512 bytes to at least get you enough functionality to get more code loaded into memory. And, and so that's the next stage that gets loaded. So that's the basic idea that's going on there. Lilo does that as well. So it loads the first part up into this memory at 7C00. Uh, that, then it actually relocates that to a different chunk of memory. It sets up a stack because in order to run code, you almost always have to have a stack. So we've got a temporary stack to use for this part. It loads in the second part of the memory and uh, then that's the part where you get a menu and you can go through and pick the operating system that you're going to boot. So if the operating system happens to be Linux, then we're going to, uh, to, to proceed from there. And the next thing it does is it displays the word loading. And I guess I should mention that in the case of Lilo up to that point, you'll actually see the word Lilo, the letters L-I-L-O displayed on the screen. Each of those letters represents a particular step in the Lilo process up to this point. And if you, if you have a problem, you can tell by how many of those are displayed, how far it got in the process this far. And I'll leave it outside of the talk to, to say what the specifics are for that, but, but if you don't see L-I-L-O spelled out all the way, that tells you, you can tell by how far it got what, what happened. But at this point you'll see loading, and now it's going to load the first 512 bytes of the actual kernel image itself, which it, it now knows how to find out on the disk. It knows which partition and so forth. So it'll load that into this particular chunk of memory, 
and then it loads a function called setup and that's going to be at the that's you've got 512 bytes here and it turns out that's 200 and then you start the setup function loading from there and then you jump to that function and start running it <clears throat> and now we're actually running Linux code but we're still setting things up and, and getting the processor ready for uh, running so at this point we can stop and maybe talk about addressing modes in the x86 world so originally on microcomputers they tended to be 16-bit machines and they had 16-bit addresses and with 16 bits you've got 10 bits which is 1k and then you've got six bits left over that you can use to count to 64 so you with with two uh, bytes with 16 bits you were limited to 64k address spaces and, and it used to be that was the most memory you could have on a microcomputer so one of the first things that was done in the PC world of in that architecture was to add this idea of a segment register that said okay we can only address 64k uh, bytes at a time but we can slide that 64k memory that, that window around in memory and so we'll we'll set a base address for it and that's done with another 16-bit register and to compute what the address is that you're actually talking about you take that segment register and you take the other 16-bit address value you shift this one over by four bits and then add this one to it and that gives you a 20-bit address and 20 bits is two tens so that's a k times a k so that basically lets you address a megabyte of space so with that scheme and, and here's an example where you take this this uh, segment address which is one two three four you shift it over by four bits which is one digit in hex and uh, then you add the other address to it and that gives you whatever the address is your, your final address that you're looking for so that's that's the uh, the old way of addressing in the the new mode of addressing which is also called the, the protected mode uh, not only do you have full size logical addresses that are mapped into memory and you don't have to do the segment business anymore but you also have support for access permissions basically on memory so when you set up page tables as part of setting up the the memory paging and stuff that we were talking about before and the page tables that we spent a lot of time talking about last last time are actually stored on the the CPU in the memory management unit it keeps up with page tables and those pages have one flag that indicates whether that page is a user page or a supervisor page what what kind of access that you have to it and when that flag is, is set to zero that page can only be accessed in kernel mode so that means when you're up executing kernel code in the kernel part you're running system calls or whatever then you have access to that page but if you're running user code then generally you don't have access to it so the the flag that indicates what your your current privilege level is which mode that you're running in it is in that CS register and it's called the CPL flag the kernel the current privilege level flag and it actually has four values so you probably hear about these four rings of, of access level in the Intel world or in, in that architecture but here we're only using two of them we're using zero for kernel mode and we're using three for user mode so basically if you're in kernel mode you can access any page in the memory map without any problem if you're in user mode you can't access pages that are limited to kernel access if you do you'll get a protection fault that'll cause a particular interrupt and, and, a, and an error will occur on the system and I'm sure you've seen the, the general protection fault errors pop up before for ACPI systems because the ACPI code gives you access to find out things about hardware one of the things that you can find out is what the memory map looks like and that means where what parts of, of RAM are, are mapped to certain devices so that that gives information about that and helps the kernel create a memory map and tells it that you know there are certain sections of RAM that are going to be used for devices and so we can't use that RAM for mapping in pages uh, of, of memory like we talked about last time so the kernel can't really use all of the memory for example on traditional PC systems if you remember back far enough they used to be limited to, to 640k and you couldn't use that very top of the full megabyte that was reserved for a lot of these these devices and things like that so Linux doesn't use that and there may be other ranges of memory that it can't use and so it needs to have an idea of what are the pages that are available for its use and it's typically way down in the lower parts of memory I think where those restricted regions are and then it has addresses you can use from there all the way up to the top in the case of uh, if you have a disk controller you can find out what what disk drives are out there and, and what their partition tables are and things like that and then you set up an interrupt descriptor table so an interrupt descriptor table 
uh, goes back to this idea of interrupts. Different devices can raise interrupts and then you want something to happen. And the most basic way you do that is you have a table that says, for example, for interrupt number 12, jump to this address and start executing code. So an interrupt table is just a set of addresses that point to different code that you run. So that gets initialized to a, a, a starting value, which is going to be changed very soon. You reset the floating point unit, the FPU. You switch to protected mode because we were running in real mode now, meaning there was no user kernel distinguish, you know, you just, the, what was running owned everything. So now we're running in protected mode. We're paying attention to those flags and uh, we're going to be using the, the memory management and paging and so forth. So that all comes into play. And then we jump to a particular address in the code that's called startup32. And there are actually two, this, this name gets used twice, but this is the, there's only this one that exists right now that we start to use. So now we set up segmentation registers, set up another stack, and then initialize the kernel's un the, uh, uninitialized data to zero. We just fill that with the zeros so it doesn't have weird numbers just sitting in there that are left over from noise while the system was initializing or whatever. And then we run this very important function called decompress kernel. So there's a long tradition in, in Linux. I don't know how far back it goes, but any version of Linux I've ever run had a compressed kernel. And so when you loaded the kernel, you actually had to decompress it into memory. And that's what happens here. And you'll actually see the message on the screen, uncompressing Linux, and the little ellipsis there. And then that happens. It, it decompresses this, the rest of this kernel code into memory. And then it says, OK, booting the kernel. So now we've loaded the whole kernel image. Before, we had just loaded some of the initial sectors of that image. Now we've loaded the whole thing. We jump into this particular address, and then we start running. And what we're running at this point is another function that also happens to be called, confusingly, setup32, startup32. But you don't really have to care about this. This is just what's happening in the background. And uh, at this point, we set up the page tables. And uh, we didn't really talk about the global page directory, but you have all these different page tables that are set up for paging. And there's kind of a, a cascading architecture that's used there. There's a particular register called CR3 that says which page table that you're using. So remember when we talked about doing a context switch from one process to another, the, each process has its own memory map, which means it has its own page table. And this is the register that you change to point to a different page table that says, OK, instead of using this map of, of pages into memory, now I'm going to be using this one. And so that's, that's where that happens. Um, we, uh, we set up kernel mode, and then we go to process zero. So the very, very first process that runs on a system is this PID0. And let me just briefly mention a little bit about what PID0 does. You usually don't see that one on a system, I think, when you do a PS listing. At least I don't think you do. Uh, there have been times, some systems you do see it. But anyway, it's, um, the, after PID0, you have PID1, which is a NIT, and we'll spend some time talking about that. But, but PID0 is the answer to the question that you might have thought about, and that is, Remember when we were talking about scheduling and when it's time to schedule a new process, you look at all the processes that have the task running run mode, the, that particular state, and those are the ones that are ready for the CPU, and you have to decide which one to schedule. Well, what if there's no task waiting on the CPU? What if all of them are asleep for one reason or another, and there's really no one that needs to use the CPU? Then what do you schedule? What does the kernel do? Well, what it does is it schedules PID0. And all that PID0 does is uh, basically issue a halt instruction and stop the CPU. And so you might think, well, great, now we've stopped the CPU. How do we get it started again? Well, if you remember how, how scheduling works, there's that, that scheduling timer that's ticking along these days usually out of kilohertz. So if nothing else happens as far as scheduling a new process, this, this tick is going to come along and, and send an interrupt after um, however long it is. A nanosecond, I guess. Is that right? Kilohertz? No, that would be a millisecond, wouldn't it? So it comes along at a millisecond, and it's going to send a, an interrupt and say, OK, let's, let's recheck the, the scheduling, the run queues, and see if anyone new needs to be scheduled. In this case, what it does is starts things back up, looks to see if there's a process out there that needs to be scheduled. If there's still no one to be scheduled, then you're back to PID0 again. So PID0 effectively represents the idle process. And when you're looking at CPU time uh, utilization, computation, all the idle time is the time that's used by PID0 just sitting there not doing anything. 
And by stopping the CPU, you're actually saving on power because you're not sitting there actually spinning and, and executing and changing transistor states and things like that. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit more uh, energy efficient than spinning or something like that. So now what we do is we go through and zero out all the interrupt handlers again. Uh, if there were any parameters that on the boot line for the kernel where you say boot and then you have all these other arguments that go there, those get loaded. Um, you identify what kind of CPU that you're running on. That's important to us here, I think. You now set up a new interrupt descriptor table, which is, which is a kernel structure that sort of does the same thing for every interrupt. What, are, what code are you going to run? And this is how you map things into device drivers. And then we jump to start kernel. And once we're at start kernel, then we call schedule init, which is going to set up the process scheduler and start scheduling other processes as soon as they're created. Um, interrupt handlers are actually filled in, and uh, we, we do the mapping from IRQs and so forth. Set the system date and time from the hardware clock. Uh, look for figuring out exactly what the CPU clock speed is and setting up some timers based on that, some delays and so forth that need to be computed. And then we create uh, a kernel thread for PID number one and then go out and exec the init program for that. So at that point, we actually have init running. So finally, we're, we're up to actually begin running just some scripts and get things started up. At this point, you can sort of think of the kernel as actually being ready for business. Everything has been initialized and set up. Scheduling is running. We're in protected mode. We have user mode and kernel mode. We have interrupt handlers for devices. Um, presumably, all the device drivers that we need have been loaded at this point. They're, they can be loaded later, but at least the ones that we need. And uh, so now we can continue from here. So the ADET program that runs, which is an actual program, uh, has this idea of a run level. And everything that it does to start up a system is based on determining what run level that you're in. And a run level, again, is just a number. And typically it ranges from zero to, to six. I don't know that there's an actual limit on what those run levels can be. And uh, you distinguish things like whether you're in single user, single user mode, multi-user mode, whether you're going to load the GUI for like a GNOME system or something like that, and uh, whether you're shutting the system down and so forth. So these are the typical default values that are pretty common uh, across run modes uh, for different systems. However, it's possible to sort of customize the meanings of these between different distributions and, and different installations. But generally, zero halts the system. One is, is usually single user mode. And single user mode, if you're not familiar with it, is a way to boot a system sort of up halfway. It, it gets you in a mode where generally you only expect to have the root user using the system. You don't have all the services running, not all the demons are running. Uh, you may or may not actually have the, the networking inter initialized and, and a network interface going. But it, it's kind of like safe mode in Windows. You want a minimal system where you can go in and work on things if you need to. And then very, the usual case with um, single user mode is that if you exit, it'll actually continue booting up into the multi-user mode. That's not always the case, but that's pretty common. Uh, or you may want to just reboot to get out of that mode. Uh, six is usually reboot the system, and there's a mode called S, which is usually only transitioned through as you're going up to the, the next run level or the default run level. There's a, a command called telenet that you can actually use if you're the root user to change what the run level is on a system and cause things to start and to stop and start and so forth. Telenet is the, actually the same code as init. It's the same program with just a different name linked to it. And it's an interesting property in uh, Unix in general that programs can tell what name they were called by and do different things depending on that. So the gzip program is an interesting example of this where you know gzip and gunzip and gzcat are really all links to the same program and it knows which, which name that you used and so it behaves differently or assumes some default options. So there is a file called Etsy init tab, and that has all the configuration for the init program. And the most important line at this point in that file is the one that says init default. This tells you what the default run level is going to be for this system when you first boot it up. If you want it to start up with a different run level, then you can specify a run level on the boot command line that you could put into Lilo or, or Grub configuration or at the boot prompt, you just type it in by hand. 
but uh, otherwise it's going to boot into this run level. And if you want it to change from here, you have to use a command like telenet or shutdown or something that's going to change the run level on the system. Just another aside about file names. Um, in uh, the Unix world in general, in Linux in particular, you'll see files that end in this tab name. That's usually an abbreviation for table. So in this case, it's the init table. You'll also see initialization files that end in RC, which is an abbreviation for, I think, an old scripting language called run command. So you see initialization scripts are either something tab or something RC. So if you look in that same file, then you'll see an entry for every run level, and all of those entries are really pretty simple. They basically say, uh, we're going to execute a script called etsy init.drc, and it's going to have an argument that says what run level it's in, and then something will happen from there. The wait command means that it's going to, to actually execute that script and then wait for it to finish before it does something else. And so we really should talk about the format and what, what these different fields mean. So if you look, there's something on the very left. Everything's colon delimited, as it frequently is in these text files in, in Unix. So first, there's just a label that probably doesn't mean very much. The second column is very, very important. The second column is a run level. And so when you're in a particular run level, what init does is it goes down through this file, looks at every line, and any line that matches the current run level that it's in, it's going to execute. So in this case, it's real simple. If it's in run level 3, it'll go down to that, the line that starts with L3 and has a 3 in the second column. But sometimes you'll look and you'll see some lines that have multiple run levels in that second column, meaning that for any of those run levels, it's going to execute whatever's on that line. So it matches, it looks at that second column. The second column is the one that matters. The first one is just sort of an ID. It's not important. It's the second one that determines what happens for a particular run level. And then after that is a command like wait, in this case, which means run the program that comes after this and wait for it to finish. There are other examples there, too. You can have respawn, which means run that program, but then go on and do something else. And by the way, if it ever dies, then run it again. So respawn is going to start the same program over and over after it finishes. So here's some examples, uh, other examples of lines that you might see. For example, there is a command control alt delete, which has to do with what happens if you press the, you know, the Vulcan pinch on the, the keyboard. And uh, in this case, this applies to all these run levels, one, two, three, four, and five, and it's going to run the program shut down with these, with these arguments on it. Uh, there's, there's a number of different power commands now that tell what, what scripts to run if you hit certain power states with all the power management. So again, the command, in this case, you notice there's no run line specified. It, it, I mean run level. It doesn't even matter, but it, the command is the important thing here. And it, they're all running some particular script with a different argument on it. So it's an ID, it's a run level, it's a particular kind of command, and then it's an actual script command line with, with arguments that you run. Uh, another example is uh, you go back to the, the old Unix systems that had lots of terminals connected to them. There was a program running on every terminal interface called Getty that would print the, the login prompt, let you log in, run your login shell, you'd do your session, you'd end your session, and then it would actually respawn another Getty. So at that point, it, it, you know, the, the original Getty had died, it would now run a new one, put up a new login prompt, and start over again. So uh, because Linux, one of the great things about Linux that you really miss with other operating systems are all of these uh, command interfaces that are on the, the uh, function keys, right? Alt uh, 1 through, I guess, 6 in this case, and that's usually the case. So you have all these terminals that are there, and you can switch between them and use them, even if your GUI's not working or whatever. And uh, so you can see here that there's actually a Getty running on each one of those. They have an associated uh, a, a line speed, an actual baud rate. Technically, it is a line speed, not a baud rate, and a terminal uh, device that they're assigned to. So before, when we were looking at all those entries and we're just running a script called RC, and then taking a number. Here's what that means. We run the RC script that takes that, that run level argument or that number. It looks for a directory that's in the Etsy directory 
that has a name of RC, a number, and then a dot D. So if you're in run level three and it runs RC space three, it's going to look for the directory Etsy RC three dot D. And in that directory, there's going to be a series of scripts that'll get run. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, if if your run level happens, if you look at what RC does in the case of zero or six. It's actually going to call, it's going to run all the scripts in that directory, and it's going to give them the uh, stop argument. And if you look at all the other scripts, it's going to call all the scripts and give them the, the start argument. And those scripts themselves do different things depending on what that argument is. There's also, when you look in those directories, you'll see a lot of scripts that start with K. Those are kill scripts, which means how to, how to kill this, this process that's running. And then there are scripts that start with an S. And so depending on which one of those modes it's in, it'll either run all the kill scripts or all of the start scripts. And the names of those scripts look like uh, S and then uh, one or two digits like 10 and then some name that goes after that. And because they all have numerical names, they just get run in order. So an S00 something will be run first, then an S01 will be run second, all the way up to an S99. Those will all be run after that. And in fact, what it's doing is just running them in alphabetical order. But because they all have two digits in the name, it just happens to run them in numerical order. So what this means is if you want to add a new startup script, you, you find the right directory that has the, the, the right run level in it. And typically there's one, and I think our default here is two. So you go to the rc2.d directory. You would sort of look at what the different services are there, the different scripts that are getting run, and decide where yours needs to go. And chances are it needs to go near the end. You know, so you want S99. You give it some unique name that's different from the others, and that's where you put your script. And then it'll actually be run during startup. So here are just some examples of what those scripts might look like. Uh, so if we're looking, for example, in the rc2.d directory, we might see an S09 NCSD, and that's the uh, uh, name server service caching daemon. So we're going, that script would get run, and they all get the argument of start. That causes them to do whatever they're going to do when they start that service up. Uh, here's one that starts with the port mapper. The cron daemon gets started, and then if we're on a, a GUI system, we start up the, the GDM, the display manager, which puts up the graphical login prompt and lets you log into the GUI. Now, it's, it's a very useful convention for there to be a copy of each one of these scripts in the etsy init.d directory. And that serves as a useful place. For example, if you want to start or stop one of these services manually, on a system, then you can usually go to that directory and find the script and then run it by hand. So if I want to stop NCSD, then I would CD into etsy init.d to that directory. I'd look and see, oh yeah, there's an NCSD script. Uh, I would run dot slash because probably the dot is not part of your path, usually for security reasons. You don't want it to, to just always search your current directory and try to run something. So you put dot slash and then NCSD and uh, then uh, space and then stop, and that would stop it. And if I wanted to start it again, I would do the same thing and start. So I could certainly go to the rc2.d directory and use the s whatever in csd, but for convenience, they're all put in that init.d directory to be used there. So for that reason, a lot of times you'll see the actual script in the init.d directory, and then in also all those rc directories are just symbolic links pointing back to those. And that makes updates really easy. You just change the one. You need to change one of these scripts. You change the one in the init.d, and you don't have to worry about what's in all the others. But you have to be careful, because sometimes it'll be a symlink, and life is good. Sometimes there'll be actual separate copies. And if you change something, you have to go and make sure and, and, and actually change the copies up there. Different versions of Unix do this different ways. But I think these days, on most of the systems that are Linux systems, it's pretty consistently a symbolic link, and, and it works the easy way. So we've already talked about these arguments on the command line that one of these startup scripts can have, start and stop, and that's pretty obvious. These days, there's likely to be a, a pretty rich set of, of arguments that they'll take, which are like commands for the startup script. And, and almost, it's, it's pretty universal that they're written so that if you just run the script by itself with no argument, it'll spew out what all the options are. So it's usually start and stop. Reload usually means don't stop running, but go out and reload your config file. 
So if a config file has been changed, this would come into play for something like bind DNS server or uh, something like that. You go out and change the config file and you want it to reload that. You would go to init.d and you run the script with a reload uh, after the script name. That usually, most of the time, means it's just going to send a hub signal to that daemon because most daemons are written so that they'll take a hub and go out and reread their config file. Uh, a force reload, I can't think of an example for that, but that basically means reload even if you don't want to. You know, restart is sort of like doing a stop and then a start, so it actually, it, it's not just rereading the config file, it's actually stopping the program and then starting it again. And uh, status, uh, some programs will let you find out something about them if you run it with that, stat, that status argument. If you look inside one of these scripts, and I'm not really going to walk through their content, but I'll just sort of tell you the kinds of things that you see there. They're really pretty easy to read. And the way that you write one of these RC scripts, one of these startup scripts, is you just find one and you copy it. Because usually the main thing that's different is the actual name of the, the, the daemon or whatever it is that you're going to execute. And there may be some arguments that are peculiar to that daemon. And you have to sort of have some sense of what you want to happen when, you, when it stops and when it starts and that kind of thing. But usually what they do is they first check for existence. They look to make sure that the actual file, the, the executable file is there. They make sure the config files are there. Uh, they run the file. Uh, sometimes they may check for other prerequisites. Maybe some other daemon needs to be running. For example, you don't want to start up uh, NFS without first having the port map uh, daemon running. By the way, there's, uh, <coughs> I guess in the Red Hat world, there's this whole sort of uh, system management, daemon management uh, architecture that exists there now. And a lot of this is kind of automated in, in that. And I, I'm not really going to talk about that. Uh, and Solaris has done a lot to uh, do the same kind of thing. Uh, for stopping processes, basically all you want to do is find the PID and send it a uh, terminate. That's usually what the idea is. And frequently there will be either a, a shell function defined or even an actual program that's out there somewhere that makes this easier. So pkill is one that's around that kind of does a grep for the command part of, of a a PS listing and finds every process with that name and then just kills them. Uh, another common thing is um, a, a lot of demons will keep a file out in the var run directory that has the PID, the, the PID for the parent of, of that uh, program there and so your code will look for that PID file, take that and send a terminate to it and then the actual demon itself knows how to go through and then tell all of its children to die and try to take things down cleanly. And I noticed in uh, Ubuntu, there's this fancy new start stop daemon script that sort of does all of this for you. So you just say start stop daemon and some arguments in the name of the daemon, and it just kind of does it all. So people have written some pretty fancy tools to handle this business. So that's what I was just saying about shutting down a particular process. And then finally, uh, in the Ubuntu world, they've decided to change everything. So even though init has been around, that's, init actually came out of System 5. And I guess it's worthwhile talking about a little bit of history. So System 5 was the uh, commercialized version of the original Unix that was written at AT&T Bell Labs. And uh, at the time, you could license source code and, and use it at your university to do research or to study operating systems and study Unix. And so versions went to, to various campuses. And of course, one went to, to Berkeley. And a lot of research that was done there resulted in the BSD version of Unix. So BSD became sort of a very different Unix from the commercialized AT&T version. So AT&T uh, went through several versions, and the notable ones were System 3 and then System 5. And BSD went through all these, these version 4 uh, versions. And uh, the way that startups, the initial, the init tab stuff was a System 5 startup mechanism. The way Berkeley did it, BSD at that time was actually much simpler. There were basically three startup scripts. There was rc.boot that did sort of the hardware type stuff. There was rc that did everything else. And then there was rc.local where you put your own stuff. So if you were adding a web server to a system and you wanted to start up that web server, you would stick startup code in, in rc.local. And there weren't all these different rc scripts out there for every little demon to start and stop them. Uh, at, there was a point in time when BSD and, and System 5 sort of merged, and that was with System uh, 5 release uh, 3, I guess, was the first one like that. And um, 
and then there was a release for a System 5 SVR4. And so a lot of these different mechanisms were merged together. But I, I notice if you look at our systems here, for example, and I guess, I don't know if that's here or if it came out of Red Hat, it actually has everything. It has the, the init and the RC scripts, which you'll still see RC and RC.local and all the others too. So you have to kind of poke around sometimes to find where something might be. So that's sort of the old way. The new way that Ubuntu has added is an entirely new uh, uh, mechanism called uh, Upstart. And uh, what they've done here is kind of the same idea as all the RC files, but they're, they're doing it for the init tab. So they take all the different kinds of initialization things that can happen, and they put those in separate files, and they're in an se of event.d directory. And uh, so each one of these so-called jobs is based on an event that can happen, and events can be startup, uh, they can be uh, uh, stop or shut down or whatever. And uh, then it will exec these files, and uh, these files are config files, and they have certain script statements inside of them. So it's kind of like an init tab file spread out over a bunch of different files to make it easier to manage, basically. And just, just a note, these files that you see in that event.d directory, they're not executable scripts. They're config files, kind of like the init tab file, and they actually have scripts in them that, that get run. So here are the upstart uh, commands. If you want to, to start one of those or, or cause it to stop, you can say start and then have the, uh, the particular name of that job, which is what those are called, those different files. Uh, you can do start, stop, and status, and you can do it in init control just to list all the ones that are currently out there sort of in a running state, started state. So that's just a little bit about Upstart, and if you want to find out more about that, it's pretty well documented. It came out of the Ubuntu project, and I think you might see it if you have used, for example, on a Ubuntu desktop, but not on a, a production server, for example. It would still be in that the traditional way. So that's most of my time. Now it's your time, and uh, I'll take any questions that anybody has. So the first question that came to my mind was, um, at the very beginning, before we call it init, Right. Uh, you said it's running all these different functions like start, start 32 and uh, decompress kernel and all sorts of other stuff. Are, are those all running under this PID zero? Or are they in some sort of magical land where there aren't PIDs yet? It's, it's in a magical land where there aren't PIDs yet. So this is like an old style operating system where you just load a bunch of code into memory and you run it. So okay. you, they're, they're, until you actually start scheduling and, and, and doing that part of the kernel function, uh, you're, you're initializing hardware basically, setting up tables and that kind of stuff. So, so there aren't even PIDs at that point. Does that work as an answer? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. It, it, the reason, it, it, PIDs and scheduling go hand in hand. So you don't have multi, you're not, another way to think of it is you're not multi-processing yet. You've just got one program that's running and it owns the entire system at that point and it, it's going out and initializing tables and setting up and still loading stuff into memory. Once all that happens, then we can start the multi-process idea, and that's when PIDs matter, when you have scheduling going on and you can have process structures created in the kernel and that kind of thing. So, so it's getting up to that point where you can start doing that. While you're thinking about questions, I, I guess just as a way of review, I'll emphasize that the main thing you want to remember out of this is, and the, the thing that's most important from the system administration point of view, is what do I do to add a new service to a system? What do I need to set up? You know, how do I go out? Do I need to change anything in the init tab? Probably not, but uh, you probably do need to either find or create RC files, and you need to know which RC directories they need to go in, and, and you probably want to put one into the uh, init.d uh, directory and then make sim links and that kind of thing. And, and what number do you give them? When do you want them to start up? Do they depend on other things? So that's the, that's the real system administration meat out of this, and that's a very common thing to do to systems. Although it is true that RPMs and, and Debian packages will usually set up these, these RC files for you, but uh, traditionally, if you don't have that done for you, that's, that's what you'd have to do, or, or maybe you'd have to debug or something like that. Okay, any other questions? All right, see you on Wednesday and Friday. <laughs>